Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Gary Pager. Um, he has an undergraduate degree from MIT and a doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, he uh, started, off, uh, started out working some at Ryder University. He's currently now working as a senior scientist at Princeton Satellite Systems and an adjunct professor of physics before that at the University of New Jersey at Ewing. And uh, the talk of his paper is on direct fusion drive, which I know several people, I've seen several pieces of that work. It's good work, and I appreciate you coming. I appreciate the comment. <clears throat> Thank you. Hello, everyone. So this, this work is a joint effort between my company, Princeton, um, Princeton Satellite Systems, and the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. And I have a, a blurb about the Plasma Physics Lab and one about my company, and then uh, a little bit more detail about direct fusion drive and book marks, of course. <clears throat> uh, Princeton Satellite Systems is a small engine, uh, aerospace engineering company just outside of Princeton. It's been in operation for 25 years now. And it does all kinds of um, uh, software and mission, mission design and a little bit of hardware for small satellites. And the, <clears throat> a uh, rocket engine based on nuclear fusion. And uh, you know, if nu nuclear fusion really has a, a bad reputation in the general press, and it's probably I don't know if it's say well deserved, but you know there are good reasons for it. And I like to point out that it, uh, in addition to it's it's always 30 years away, it, it's got it's got the N word and the F word, and it just doesn't look good. So uh, our mission plan and our engine gets us to Alpha Centauri in 250 years, and it, and it goes into orbit around the planet there. It stays there, and once you get there, you're going to have uh, megawatts worth of power in order to do science experiments and drive communications at uh, megabit per second rates. Um, when a, a planetary scientist, when we're also designing mission to Pluto, for which we have a, a NIAC grant, and the planetary science, scientist heard that and he said, "You mean, you mean I can drill?" You know, so having a megawatt available is. Uh, important to the planetary scientists. Um, Alpha Centauri is the, the target of our mission plan. And of course, there's a candidate, various candidate planets there. Support uh, a current NIAC grant, phase two, two NASA SDTRs for various aspects of the engine, and uh, some support from the Department of Energy at the, at the lab for studying the, the basic physics of, of the thing. Uh, there is a reactor in Princeton, and it's maybe operating right now. There's a picture of it. A uh, summary of some of its characteristics. It's a, it's a simple array of uh, magnetic coils and linear geometry. I'm going to go back to the very beginning. I mean, the, the, the thing naturally, uh, the, as a natural geometry that just says, make a rocket engine out of me. It's small. The physics of this uh, limits the size of this thing to... 10 megawatts, and the diameter to about uh, two meters. And then that's because of the heating method that's used to excite the plasma. It's an RF heating system. And so it's, uh, by its nature, it can't be very big. So uh, it, uh, it is either a device or a small rocket engine or an aircraft carrier or something like that, or it's a module that can be combined into a larger uh, larger engine. It's clean. The reaction that we use is uh, aneutronic. The primary reaction is aneutronic. I'll talk more about that. Um, it's not a tokamak. It's a, re a field reverse configuration. So uh, it's not, a, it's, right, it's, it's different physics than a uh, tokamak. The, the, the novel invention that makes it work is this so-called odd, odd, par odd parity RF heating. <clears throat> Here's an outline of, of the device. The, this yellow thing here is, is the fusion area. That's a torus uh, that is uh, centered on the center line of the, uh, of the engine. And uh, these are a bunch of uh, magnetic uh, 
super, ho hopefully superconducting coils, but possibly not. Uh, propellant is stored in this, uh, what we call a gas box, and uh, the propellant is a deuterium. And the deuterium, deuterium flows past the fusion region. This region that flows past the fusion region is called the scrape off layer. So you'll see more about this a little bit. The magnetic field lines go across that and carry the uh, propellant, uh, ionized propellant, across the, uh, not into the fusion region, but around it. And the reaction particles, the, the, uh, the fusion particles, the re re are uh, spinning around after they're produced. And they um, um, go through the, they spiral through the scrape off layer each time, losing a little bit of energy to the electrons in the plasma. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> and we add uh, additional propellant in order to, uh, the, the raw thrust of this thing is actually quite low. So we add additional propellant to augment the thrust. Um, I think I said most of this already. Um, this was from another. There's a magnetic nozzle. That's, I'll talk about that later again, too. That's where the energy is transferred from the electrons to the ion and where the thrust is generated. Um, we got pretty high uh, and variable uh, exhaust velocity. Yeah, so the primary uh, reaction is deuterium and helium-3. And that produces a, uh, an alpha particle and a, and a proton, both charged particles. So they can be uh, removed by the magnetic fields in the, in the, or, or, or guided by the magnetic fields along the scrape-off layer. There are slide reactions because there's deuterium there. It's hot deuterium. So there will be some uh, uh, tritium, tritons, produced along with another uh, proton. And um, this fellow here, there is one uh, neutron coming out of the DD reaction. It's a, a very low energy neutron, at least compared to, well, the 14 MeV that comes from a, a, D, a DT reaction, for example. And uh, there isn't that much of it. There's only, um, it's only less than 1%. Now, the DT reaction, the from the, the triton that's produced in this DD reaction uh, is uh, negligible because the, the triton is exhausted before it has time to fuse it, the, by orders of magnitude. So there's, there's essentially no uh, DT reaction in this device. So I'm gonna go backwards now. And so the low neutron production due to uh, various reasons. One is a neutronic primary reaction, large surface area to volume ratio, non-stoic metric, helium to deuterium ratio, fast tritium removal, and preferential heating of the helium. All those things contribute to making the neutron prediction very low. And the result of that, of course, is much reduced shielding and a longer material life. You know, either has a, a meter thick blanket of lithium in order to stop the neutrons. We, this, we hope uh, a few centimeters of, we're not sure what, silicon carbide perhaps, and longer material life. Without the neutrons, no neutron damage. And this little uh, graphic here is a, supposed to show a version of this, a terrestrial version of the of the FRC that could be used for uh, terrestrial power. And the point here is that these guys are standing right next to it. Right? The, the work is divided between uh, the, the plasma physics lab and Princeton Satellite Systems. The lab is working on the plasma physics and uh, the RF generator, although we're doing that jointly. That work is being done jointly. And Princeton Satellite Systems is working on the balance of plant. Um, the, the, the removal of the heat. So there's going to be heat generated from that, that neutron, that one neutron, and also from Brenstolung synchrotron radiation. And that's going to be captured in a, a blanket surrounding the, actually in the shielding blanket, and then removed and, and, and used through a break and cycle engine. Um, along with the, uh, the startup, the startup engine, which is going to uh, run a chemical power, will be generated by a chemical reaction, and the radiators. Here's the results of some modeling done uh, at the 
Vincent Plaza Physics Lab based on the UH code from uh, Livermore. And for some orientation, here's the engine, that same car cartoon. Here's a, a scale drawing of the magnetic field lines in the scrape off layer. Um, and this is it expanded in the uh, uh, radial direction. So um, the, the electron heating occurs here. So the, the, the torus is rotating around here. There's a current in that torus rotating around there. And the, uh, uh, the ash from the fusion reactions uh, hit the scrape off layer here and transfer energy to the electrons. And this is, what, that's what, this is what the models show us here. So this is the electron temperature, cool here and warm out here in the nozzle. Oops, all the way around. The electrons are hot here and cooler out here in the nozzle, whereas the ions are, are cool here. And the ions don't heat up until they're in the nozzle. The electrons are heated in the scrape off layer. Yeah, I just said all that. I think that's all I wanted to say there. More results of the mod uh, modeling. How much thrust we get uh, from a mo one module, a model, model, module, and uh, the exhaust velocity. So for a, a six megawatt, this one, this orange one, is a six megawatt module um, with a particular gas flow rate, you can get about 60 newtons with a exhaust velocity in 100,000 kilo, kilo, 100 kilometers per second. The thrust is variable with the gas flow, and it's limited by the energy transfer dynamics. The, uh, this model is a particular geometry, and it's not necessarily the geometry that will actually be used in a rocket engine. So some of the features aren't exactly right, but uh, the, the, the general gist of this is, is correct, that they will have the uh, ability to vary the thrust at a constant power level. So our mission, we have a mission to Alpha Centauri that we model. Uh, for instance, we do, not me personally, my colleagues, do a lot of mission planning at, uh, in orbit dynamics at Princeton Satellite Systems. <laughs> And this is a simple result of a straight line trajectory to Alpha Centauri. Just, with a, just a rocket equation, mass and structure and power, that's, that's all it is. And it suggests to us that <clears throat> you can get it to Alpha Centauri, that says four, I know you can't read it, that's four light years um, with, uh, what does that say? 300, I can't read that, 300 Newtons, 30 Newtons. And it will take us 250 years to get there. About halfway, a little bit more than halfway uh, along, we, we turn the rocket around and slow down. So we start at zero velocity, we end at zero velocity. And here's a rate of fuel consumption. And fuel, well, the deuterium, the uh, helium-3, you need about, uh, it's coming up, I think it's like 5,000 kilograms of helium-3. There's a lot of helium-3, I know. but. The specific power and mass, <clears throat> the specific power, in order to get uh, the 30 Newton thrust uh, at a specific power of uh, 100 kilowatts per kilogram. 100 kilowatts per kilogram, now, that's also uh, quite a challenge. It's not gonna, you know, nothing about this is gonna be easy, but where our initial engines we expect to be uh, considerably less than that. And uh, the engine mass versus uh, specific power. So the engine as a whole, when it has 38 modules, 38 10 megawatt modules, it will generate 380 megawatts, uh, 5,200 kilograms of uh, helium, specific power, 100 kilowatts per kilogram, with a payload of 1,000 kilograms. Gets there in 250 years. I think there's a mistake on that, by the way, but I'm going to gloss it over. So, once we, how do we, what do we do once we get close? So, we've invented a, uh, 
an imaginary assumed planet, one astronomical unit from Alpha Centauri A, in the same plane as the AB orbit. So we approach Alpha Centauri system, and when we're a few years away, we, we begin to reduce the velocity in the direction perpendicular to the parafocal plane, so that when we hit the plane, our uh, velocity perpendicular to the plane is zero. We're, we're in the plane, and we're heading towards, well, we're in some kind of orbit around A. Oh, and of course, I skipped this part, right? This is 200 years in the future. And, uh, well, we're not gonna, we, we're gonna be able to see Alpha Centauri much better from a few years away than we can from here. So the, the spacecraft is gonna have to have the ability to evaluate what it sees. It's gonna have to uh, search the system for candidates that maybe have not been found um, and cho choose a target all autonomously and find the orbit and then adjust its uh, approach parameters to match that orbit. <clears throat> So once you're in the perifocal plane, then you uh, reduce the orbit to that one imagined one AU planet around Alpha Centauri A. That's kind of a funny looking orbit, but this is a constant thrust maneuver. You just turn the thing around in order to uh, adjust the uh, approach to the orbit. E turns out is far, uh, B, excuse me, Alpha Centauri B turns out is far enough away that it can be practically neglected for this level of uh, analysis. It's just a disturbance. And once you're there, you're going to have a lot of power for science, it's obvious, but also communication. So another imagined device is a huge communication system with a 16-meter aperture. And we've got three different 16-meter apertures to look at. We've got a KA band antenna, a millimeter band antenna, and uh, uh, a laser. Right, 16 meter diameter laser with uh, running, and all of them running one, one megawatt. So you want one megawatt CW modulatable laser with a 16 meter aperture. Uh, and a 34 meter receive aperture, which I think is the size of the Deep Space Network telescopes. And a simple calculation uh, gives us a, a Ka band rate of 500 bits per second microwave at 30,000, optical two, two megabits per second, which is pretty, pretty good data rate. That's even much better than New Horizons. Um, on our mission to Pluto, we, things are much better. We can get HDTV from Pluto. So we're looking at other missions, as I mentioned. We've got the, this one, the Alpha Centauri Orbiter. We've got a Pluto mission, also an orbiter, that we've uh, going into a lot of detail with. That's the subject of our NIAC grant, is the Pluto orbiter. We're looking into the 550 AU um, lensing mission. Uh, a human Mars round trip, this is something we did a few, looked at a few years ago, 310 days there and back, with two weeks at Mars. And asteroid, uh, asteroid deflection, we looked at that as well. And with that, I think that's perfect timing. I'm all done. That's me and my colleagues and uh, the inventor, uh, Sam Cohen, from the, the primary inventor of the science, uh, Sam Cohen from Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. And that's Alpha Centauri. Anybody have any questions? <laughs> so, and I Retired from our labs. Um, two questions. You said uh, you were in dilute. Uh, the stream with some other gas. Um, I didn't know what your ratio was on that. Um, I'm not sure either, to tell you the truth. I don't know what their ratio is. Uh, but I think actually for the, it, it's much less for the interstellar mission where we right. need the high. Exactly. Okay. And for the interplanetary missions, it's a bit higher, maybe 10 to 1. I'm guessing though. Pretty much diluted for interplanetary. And then uh, what fraction of your uh, carrier helium? Uh, I asked that question a few weeks ago, and um, it was, now I have to remember, the test reactor, I think we were expecting 
one uh, percent, I think. I may be lying about that, but in this reactor, I'm not even I'm not sure what it would be. The test reactor would be the first fusion reactor <coughs> that's planned for several years from now. So I guess that doesn't really answer your question. This is concerning the scaling yet, uh, scaling. And you said that uh, you're, you said that your uh, prototype is around 10 megawatts and you can't get much bigger than that. Well, that's not the prototype. That's the final engine. Oh, the final engine. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, but the missions you have for Alpha Centauri uses 380 megawatts. That's right. So, is what would be the scaling limit for for the uh, for your for the direct fusion drive? I think it's only limited by the extra hardware needed to uh, mend them all together. It's the only thing I can really think of. So it's fully scalable? As far as I know, it's fully scalable. We just, we just strap them together. Right? And by the way, that allows, it, allows staging on the uh, trip to Alpha Centauri, which you know, you know, re reducing the mass as we go. We can reduce the time by about 10% by doing that. I've got a question regarding the fusion mechanism. You say you're using a field reverse configuration. Um, do you know what um, techniques you're using to handle instabilities in the toroidal plasma? Like, are you using rotating magnetic field or, or things like that? The, uh, I'm not the person to answer that, unfortunately. But uh, I've been told that it's expected that the instabilities will be um, um, manageable. The, the people have told me that. That's all I can say about it. Or negligible, even. You showed a diagram earlier that had your deuterium propellant being fed into the reactor area. And you said it goes around the reactor core. <coughs> My question is, how do you get additional helium-3 into the reactor core? Yeah, that's another interesting question. We don't have that fully worked out, but there actually, if I, if I can go all the way back to See that little thing there? That's the helium-3. That's supposed to be putting helium-3 into the uh, re reactor region. And exactly what that hardware looks like, we're, we don't know yet. Uh, great talk. Um, met your, uh, your colleagues before. So my question is uh, uh, not a challenge, but just to try to address it the way that you need it. Um, Fusion, with the exception of uh, the nuclear weapons, um, has always looked good on paper, but it's when you actually try to actualize it, the problems have occurred, mm -hmm. which you know much better than myself. And so um, this looks great on paper and PowerPoint. At some point, you have to build something that's actually a fusion reactor, which is still eluding us um, as a species. How do you see that occurring? And what amount of funding do you want that? Well, I think I have something that addresses that. Here's a, an outline of the, uh, the, the plan going forward in the immediate future. What is running now in Princeton is this one, P PFRC2, Princeton Field Reserve, Reversed Configuration Reactor Number 2. And its goal is to study ion heating, the reverse, the um, rotating magnetic field, the RF heating mechanism. And it's See, it goes to 2017. It's in operation right now, uh, about $4 million worth of funding. And uh, in the next four years, we expect to start work on a PFRC3, which will try to, which will, uh, its goal will be to achieve temperatures higher than five kilovolts. And then 3B will be the reactor that uh, produces fusion. And you can see the date there, it's 2026. And, but the price tag is $25 million. Now, I don't know how realistic that is, but the, the, the guys at the lab and my, Mike and Stephanie have gone through those numbers, and that's what they came up with, $25 million, uh, to get uh, a reactor that produces fusion in uh, 2026. Um, one more question. Uh, you mentioned earlier that um, the, uh, you had reduced shielding requirements for this configuration. Do you know what kind of temperatures the internal reactor was expected to face and what kind of shielding was going to be used? Yeah, I should know the answer to that, but uh, again, that's not, uh, I didn't figure that out before I came, unfortunately. All right.